We now are going to talk about computer software. Okay? Computer software. All right. Here is what we start with. Okay? You know what a computer can do? It's going to have an opcode. Okay? Yeah, we talked about it. A task or a thing that the computer can do will have an opcode. Okay? But you know what? That doesn't always give you everything that you need. It's a code of what to do. But sometimes you might have a code of what to do that might be like, go get information from a port. Well, where is a port located? It's always at an address. So the opcode itself, those ones and zeros, might not tell you everything that you need to know to actually execute that full thing. Okay? At this point, we've got to stop using words like thing in thingamabob, okay? So we are going to refer to the instruction as the complete task, not even task, the complete instruction that you will do, okay? The path through the finite state machine. And it will always have an opcode, which is the, the ones and zeros of what you're going to do. But any other information that you might need, such as an associated address, or data is going to be provided within the instruction as what we call an operand. Okay? Now, this is an instruction. You design the computer to execute instructions. When I come back to the original drawing of this, this right here was an instruction. This right here was an instruction. This right here was an instruction. You design how many instructions your computer needs in order to be useful. You know what you call all of the instructions that you created and decided to bundle up into one computer? You, you called it, no, this isn't the program. This is how many, how many different instructions you can execute. It's called the instruction set. Ah, pretty simple. There's actually two philosophies on instruction sets. One of them is called a RISC instruction set. Does anybody know what RISC stands for? Reduced instruction set computer. It's where somebody believes that it's better to make a computer with as few instructions as possible and have the computer run really, really fast. So we'll chip away at its problem solving, but we'll do it just a little bit at a time. But if we make the computer with fewer instructions, this huge finite state machine gets smaller and smaller, there's less delay, and you run it faster. Okay? That's a risk processor. And it's a philosophy that people adopt. We have risk computer systems out there. Okay? And you say, okay, well, that's fun. How many instructions do you think you need to build a risk? This is a classic interview question. You can do it with five instructions. Okay? Just five. And you can do everything that a computer can do. Okay? Now, we'll get to that later. The other philosophy is called a CISC. And you don't use that very much. It's just it's basically risk or not risk. But CISC stands for complex instruction set computer. And this is like what Intel does. Intel says, you know what? Everything that I want to do, I'm going to build another instruction to do it, put more hardware in there because I'm so good at making hardware. Okay? So there's two kind of philosophies in how you do that. Okay? Life is good. Life is good. One of the first things that we need is to take the opcode and the operand, this instruction set. And we need to be able to put it into memory, but you know you're not going to put it into memory as ones and zeros. Okay? That would suck. Okay? People used to do that. They used to program a computer by typing in ones and zeros into the memory system. Okay? That was what punch cards were. You'd punch for a one, punch for a zero, whatever, and you'd make all the ones and zeros on punch cards, and then it would cycle through all the opcodes. That sucks. What we want to do is we want to write the software in a higher level of abstraction but not all the way to like C++. We want to have a way to put the instructions into memory using a human wordish that makes sense, but is a direct connection to one single instruction. And we call that the mnemonic. Okay? The mnemonic is very simple. It's stuff like load A, load B, store B. Okay? And we'll go through all the mnemonics. But what we're going to do is we're going to define the instruction set as ones and zeros, codes that go into memory, and then we will come back and we will say, I'm going to assign a little word for them, and that will allow me to actually write the program and insert it into memory 
and it'll look just like code. When you program using mnemonics, what type of programming is that? Assembly code. So this is assembly code. This is what you've potentially done. Load A, load B. You're programming an assembly. We will never go above this assembly. Okay? We are going to program it. You might go, dude, how the hell are we, are we going to build a compiler or something? We're at VHDL. We're going to put ones and zeros into a memory system that we designed in VHDL. Okay? We're going to do it with constants. So we will just define a constant, have a name, and say that's equal to 4, 7. And then that we can insert it into our ROM memory and execute. Okay, okay. So let's look at what these things look like when they get into memory. Okay? The first thing that you have to do in a computer is decide what's the starting address. Because the computer needs to know, where's that first instruction at? Okay? I need to know where the instruction is. You know what address we're going to use in our computer? Zero. Why wouldn't we? Okay? That is what we are going to call our reset address. And it's going to be very simple. We're hard coding it. Boom. When I hit go, meaning the reset button, this computer will go to, to address zero, which is in program memory, and grab the first opcode for the first instruction. Okay? Now, what we do is we stuff all the instructions into memory in one block. We don't leave gaps. Okay? And the reason we don't do that is because we need to know, as we move through this with the program counter, where we are and where we're going. Okay? So you don't, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be reading and then incrementing the program counter. And then we know that if we incremented it, it's pointing to the next address. And we need to know that something's there. Okay? If something is not there, like it's a, it's a blank, you might go out and accidentally read a, a bogus code and, tr and think it's an opcode, and your computer will crash. Okay? And they're, they're, that actually happens. Okay? Has anybody had a computer crash on them? A couple? Computers used to crash all the time. Did you know that? No. <laughs> Never heard of such a thing. Okay. Here is what it might look like. Let's say we had three instructions, and we put them into memory, and the first instruction had an opcode and an operand. We would stuff the opcode in one memory location and the operand right after it. Here comes another instruction. Opcode 2, operand 2. We put that right after it. Okay? And then let's say we had another instruction which only needed an opcode. So you have three random instructions. We pump them all into memory. And I want you to think about something. I am a CPU. I walk up to this dude and I say, read me an opcode. And you read that opcode and you bring it over into the CPU and you look at it. How do I know if there's an associated operand with you read that code and you know, oh, I just decoded it. This instruction is to do the following thing and I know that that op code requires an operand. The operand is always right next to the opcode in the next address location. So by decoding it, you know, hey, I need to go back and read again from the operand and use that information to complete the instruction. Okay? Let's say now we completed the instruction. We need to know where the next opcode is. We're done with this first instruction. This dude is done. And we're like, that was so fun, I want to do it again. I need to know by design where the next opcode is to go grab. Well, it needs to be located at the next location in memory right after this first instruction. That's where it has to be. If you know it's there, you can design the program counter to simply increment through and be pointing to where that opcode is. Okay? You read opcode 2. Oh, it needs an operand. It must be in the next location in memory. Let's go get it. Oh, I'm done with that instruction. Where's the next opcode for the instruction? It's at the next location in memory. This is how we have the program counter cycle through, increment through the program memory in order to retrieve these opcodes and operands. How does that feel? It retrieves opcode 3 and says, hey, this instruction does not need an operand. So I know I'm done. 
If I had a fourth instruction, where would it be? Right there. Okay? So we need to make sure that we stuff the information into memory as tight as possible. Okay. So I'm feeling pretty good. Life is good. Okay? Now we think about types of instructions. Okay? And we start thinking about, okay, what, what, let's first start with these operand things. Okay? What type of information could be in an operand? Okay? Well, the first thing that you might have is the operand might be data. Okay? It might just actually be data itself. Okay? So you might come along and you might do the following. You might say to yourself, let me see if I have a beautiful picture. I should have a beautiful, no, I don't have a beautiful, let me go back to this beautiful picture. Let's say that we had an instruction, okay, that the operand was the data. Let's go back and use our example 10. We want to load 10 into register A, okay? 10 is the constant. It is the piece of information, and that is associated with the instruction. It is part of the instruction. So in that situation, we have an operand, which is the data. Now what we do is we, take, we describe what the operand is for the instruction using this concept of an addressing mode. Okay? So when you talk about the term addressing mode, it's talking about what does the operand mean. Okay? So in the situation where the operand is the data, it is called immediate addressing. Okay? So immediate addressing. This becomes important to think about what type of addressing it is when you build the finite state machine. Because if you know that instruction is using immediate addressing, then when you read the operand, you know what to do with it. Okay? Does that feel good? Now you go, what the hell? Why are you telling me this? Okay? What else could the operand ever be? It's either data or what? What's another thing that the operand could be? An address. Maybe the operand isn't the information to put into a register like A. Maybe the, maybe the operand is an address of where the information might be. And you go, now nah, you're getting a little wacky. But think about this. If I wanted to read from a port, okay, I want to go read from a port. That port's at an address. That instruction has to have the address of that port that I'm reading from. So this is the second thing that an operand can be. It can be the address. And we call that type of addressing direct addressing. Okay? So now we have two different types of addressing mode. Yes? Is that how you would handle having more than one operand? More than one address worth of data? More than one address worth of data? Well, it, that, like an array it could point to the start of an address. Okay. Right. okay. But I'll tell you this. Remember, this is the simplest computer, just enough to get it to run. At the end of this, you will go, God, I wish I had more addressing modes. I wish I had more registers. And you will see why there are more registers in real computers. Okay? This represents the bare bones to get it to actually execute a program. Okay? Okay. What's the third type of addressing mode? Okay? Well, what if the instruction doesn't need an operand? And the example is, if I said A plus B, and you put the result somewhere, so I'm going to um, have an instruction which says, you know what, just read the opcode, and it's going to take A, add it to B, and stick the sum in A. And I'll use the ALU to do it. We didn't need data. We didn't need any constants. Okay. We also didn't need to access any other part of our memory system. So we have an instruction which does not need an operand. That is actually a specific type of addressing mode, and it's called inherent. Okay? So you have inherent addressing. Those are the three that we will implement in our computer. Pretty simple. Either the operand's data that we put into a register, either it's an address of where to go get the information or where to put information, or it's going to be gone. Okay, it's not going to be there. So those are the three types. 
if you were so savvy as to have taken 371, what is another type of addressing mode that you used a lot? We're not going to do it in our computer. Indexed addressing. You're like, what the hell? Now, this is a random. This is a random thing to enter into this book because I talk about it, but we don't implement it. Okay? Indexed addressing is where you could potentially have a register in your CPU which holds the address of where to go get it, and the operand is going to alter that address. So here's an example of what it might look like. Let's say that I had my computer, <clears throat> and I'm going to go read from an output port, let's say FF, and I put FF into B. Okay? And I read an instruction, and it says, I'm using index addressing. That means my operand is the address I'll go to. Okay? So maybe the operand was like 1, or no, let's, that's a stupid example. The address is like 100. So you would add 100 FF, form a new address, goes into the MAR, and you go read from that. Okay? So we're always trying to figure out how to create these addresses to get into the memory system. 